Hey, hey. hey. Perfect. Hi. Nice to meet you. So Cody's, Cody's playing the percussion counterpart. Alex, okay. Alex. Yes. Yeah. Hi. Great. Yeah. Yeah. Of course. Thanks so much for uh, for taking the time to to speak with us with uh, with everything going on into the semester and and all of the craziness. But um, yeah, we've we've absolutely loved taking a listen to uh, to some of your pieces over the past uh, past few weeks and um, reading a little bit of your work and um, and taking a look at, uh, at kind of what you're all about. So that's um, it's been really great. One of the things that's funny, I I came to your music. I think a lot of my friends came to your music through Wild Thing. Like they had the the score okay. follower video. I came oh, nice. through. Okay. Who flamed oddly enough? Um, okay, was was how I first found it. A buddy of mine had a couple years back had passed along the video from the Shurgat production. Okay, that's great. And so I, I came to know your work on the stage first. So it was interesting uh -huh. coming back now in the past couple of weeks, returning to your chamber writing, mm -hmm. um, which while it's certainly different, it has the same sort of theatricality about it. Mm -hmm. It's just a little more tangible in the mm -hmm. stage works. Yeah, friend um, is. Aesthetically, not so far from Wild Thing because mm -hmm. it was the same kind of year. I wrote Wild Thing for an ensemble in Stuttgart, Ascolta, and then in that performance, got the commission for Friend. The first scene was kind of a chamber version. And mm -hmm. so that's all the Stanford years, so to say. <laughs> um, just the recent, like, eight, nine years, I moved slowly away from this. Um, I'm always happy to hear that somebody hears the theater music in America because it's harder to, you know, get that out here. Um, so that, that's great. It is. And what's, I mean, it's, it can be frustrating, particularly because there's so many opera companies, you'd think that somebody would have picked up one of the, one of the European operas by now. I have to say friend though, it's, I was, it was really a graduate student's pipe dream. I have <laughs> like an 80 person orchestra seated around the audience, a choir singing soloistically and electronics and guitars and keyboards that's, that was that's not going to happen again um well, that is yeah. not in the states you still see them you still see those productions in in europe but not not these days in the states my new opera is for a small ensemble uh, 10 players and just four singers so and alan pearson is conducting it so it's in english that i'm i'm pretty optimistic that we will be able to do this year but what? first it has to come out in in mannheim um in all of this so that's the first step yeah. what's the story of choice it's called Dark Spring, which, so it's a, the material is a spring awakening story, um, mm. but in opposite to the musical, not naturalistic, it's today, just four players, the, the abortion and the, the botched pregnancy sort of is not the topic. It's really more about these sort of emotions and feelings among these, these four young people in late capitalism, the pressure mm -hmm. they feel, the impossibility to succeed, even if, if you're seemingly successful, the sexual pressure the aggression that comes so it's it's kind of a more of a, of a emotion piece almost less story um in, in the end the story is very compressed and it's in songs it's uh, has it's a song opera <laughs> uh, but it was it was great great fun to write i have to say it was really nice uh, to you know write english songs i have a fantastic libertist joshua clover who wrote the song lyrics um poet from california so it was, a, it was a good good collaboration. Now we hope that we actually can do it. <laughs> yeah. Well, yeah. The, the trajectory in your music is often so immaculately well thought out. And, you know, I'm thinking of scenes from Primed, right? The transition from, uh, or between the two styles of music as they mm -hmm. sort of gradually come to, come to head at each other. How do you approach songwriting? <laughs> it's just a different, it's a different vein. Yeah, it was a different thing. I, it was a little bit coming back though. I, Wrote, I played in a band when I was 16, uh, so I wrote songs, actually in English back then, terrible. Um, <laughs> but so I, I've done it before in a way, and I, I love songs. I love song time and sort of the good American musical songs. <laughs> um, but also lead, I always analyze with my students, lead from Schubert to George Crump. And in a way, it's easier because you have a contained form. I, we did it that I used the original text and cut it down to 11 scenes and then I always had a starting line for the lyricist, the songwriter, to deliver a sort of a text that's based on this or triggered by this. And then the text came back and that was my starting material. So I had already at least some kind of content and even in a way time, if, if it has strokes and, and repetition and so on, container that I then had to fill. And that in a way made it almost intuitive, you know, sitting by the piano, trying out 
certain things. Of course, I had a larger harmonic trajectory and rhythmic trajectory for the piece. So that was another constraint. And then I could kind of play around with it. And it was really, really fun, I have to say. For, for a topic like Spring Awakening, it must be nice to be surrounded by college students and to sort of have some, some test subjects to look at in the process. Maybe. I think it was more triggered by... I, I always wanted to do this. I was really influenced when I was a teenager, early in my early 20s, by sort of writing uh, Brad Easton Ellis, Below Zero, um, and also to Reinhard Goetz, a German writer from the same kind of vibe, trying to explore something that seems very autodestructive and very full of suffering in a way, but also seductive in mm. the kind of freedom that also lies in a certain you know, position. And so that was always in the back of my head. I also have two teenage children um, who are now in college. So I, I think that also, and I saw much closer, I think with them than with my college students, with my, with my own composition students, sort of the experience they make. And um, so, yeah, that was, and also I think in the end, the political angle came very strong because uh, you all are very young, just from judging by your images. It's a different experience after the financial crisis, I think, to grow up in America. And um, what well, I would almost call it, you know, the, the suggestion of, let's almost call it lie of, this is all gonna work out, is much more transparent, I feel. And that changed the narrative of how these, in my, in my opera, these four young characters interact and position themselves and how they feel they can succeed or not. So that's, I found that interesting in the piece. Um, so you, you're bringing up um, you're bringing up this this uh, this idea of crisis is is really interesting. I mean, just given the time and and everything that we're we're kind of going through now. So um, if I kind of take that and and spin it, you know, a little bit more towards the sure. kind of hands-on approach, you know, what impact uh, from your point of view? And I'm sure everybody's going to have kind of a lot of thoughts on this, but just with you know the crisis that we're in and music making and creativity, you know, what what do you think some of the lasting impacts of of this particular moment that we're in? might be and, and whether that's from like the performance side of things you know we're all getting really good at virtual performance how does that how does that translate but um you know just being stuck at home you know are people making things or are they not you know what do you what do you think is going to happen going forward it's very difficult to say to be honest it's like you know describing the hurricane from the middle of the i feel there are different angles the most important for me was early on immediately to see that we have to think differently about labor and, um, and art in this country. And that sounds so, you know, uh, pretentious in a way because people have been doing this for quite a while, but I think the crisis became really clear when it's obvious that freelancers in a crisis like this have zero network to fall back on. I have a university job that was my network. Um, and that's incredibly unfair that there's this one employed part of the country and the other not. So I feel that's hopefully something that where discussion starts. And I, I would love to be part of that. I run this Institute for New Music at Northwestern. It would be great to have some kind of think tank or sorry, such a weird word, or just some to think together about how can we organize this differently. Uh, work, art, um, labor, in, and, and the financial conditions of it, of course, in the end. Um, and that's, it's a tricky, I, I have no answer to this. I think that the crisis right now, just sort of focusing certain problems that have been underneath all of this all the time. Uh, even before the crisis, you just have to be, to get sick, you know, and as a freelancer that already changes everything. So um, that would be one aspect. Uh, yeah, other than that, it's, it's obviously the university where I teach um, makes it also clear. We have to rethink how we are, what is a, research university in, in a situation where maybe our concept of public space and how we interact is changing. But you see already, I'm, I'm going into cliches. I really don't know. Beg, beg the question to me. I mean, this is a, it's a big, uh, mm. ever, ever existing problem or question for a lot of composers, the relationship between the political and music mm -hmm. and the nature of music to be political, of subject matter to be political. Mm -hmm. You know, it's something you're facing head on in the new opera, but what are your thoughts with, I mean, as a, as a whole in your output, is it something that you think about often? Yeah, it's, as you say, it's a very tricky topic because you either become a preacher or, you know, or apolitical, which none of us is. Um, I don't have a clear strategy there or method or position even, I would say. It's more that in 
music is inherently political because it's communicative. And if it's just between, you know, the six or five members of an ensemble organizing how they play a bar together, that's a political organization or how they, what they want to play and how, how they want to organize themselves. Um, to the composer organizing a score and how that is in position to our world we're in. So in the operas, of course, it's much more direct because I have a representational content a story that is being told. And if it's a political story or at least has political aspects in it, that's more clear. Um, then the other question is, what does the music do in there? Does it just rhetorically support it? Which sometimes that's fair enough. In my earlier pieces, something like Wild Thing and even Framed, I think there was a much clearer position of music as critique and as deconstruction in the sense of taking something that is socially, culturally established apart. And uh, you saw a friend in Stuttgart, that was a shock, you know, in the opera house when a scene starts with one minute of Carubini, their big bel canto, which they all love, and then slowly it's being ripped apart, literally, so, and, and violated. Um, so that was a statement about beauty on an opera stage, about the values behind that kind of material, um, the bel canto, the, um, how the female character, in this case, Medea, is exposed and so on. So that was a very clear statement where the music also took part in some kind of direct destructive, anarchic activity. Um, and in the instrumental music from that time, Wild Thing, Moment Musico, there are aspects of that as well. Nevertheless, though, I think music always has this aspect of utopia. You find that in Nono and in Lachemann, where, where you transcend that purely critical and, and offer a different mm. possibility, a different harmony, a different mm. concept of beauty. And I think that's a beautiful aspect of music as well. Um, and it's a very difficult path. It's, it, you, you can't just, you can never take it off the shelf. You kind of have to arrive there and with, with your audience and with your performers to, to kind of discover together that other beauty, other harmony. But in my, my recent pieces, I think that position has become a bit more timid or careful <laughs> um, where I feel sometimes just giving these four characters in the opera, for example, just giving them a voice is already enough. Just giving them a platform to express their sentiment, their feelings. That's all I can handle right now. I just finished the third and second movement to a piece, Harmonie Musique, which was written for Talia last year or two years ago, which is incredibly consonant and harmonic and tonal. And I think it was an attempt to write something where all the negativity that is also, that it's informed on is kind of outside of it. And it's just present by its absence, so to say. But, and this piece is an attempt of having 25 minutes being really in a kind of a happy place, um, as strange as that sounds. So um, yeah, sorry, long circle. But I, Political could be two hours of discussion. It's striking to watch over over history, right? The the sort of timid return to triads, right? In Das Mädchen, it occurs once. We have that one massive minor chord, and it's gone. Mm -hmm. It's like that flicker of light for a moment. Mm -hmm. um, and so, over in, over the course of the last twenty years, right, we're sort of seeing this creep back in of, con like Wolfgang Riem is the perfect example, right? Consonance isn't necessarily a forbidden fruit mm -hmm. here. It can be touched. It can be equally as expressive. We don't have to live in the ruins of romanticism. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I also came to the thought that I feel maybe music is less capable of certain critical positions than I thought. <laughs> and just sort of taking a step back and trying to do what I can do with it mm -hmm. uh, is, is maybe enough for, for now. But I think it also had to do, maybe it came out of a deep political depression in a way that where I felt, you know what, I, in this situation, the only thing I can do is write 25 minutes of something where I, I put in a good place for now, and that might be enough. Obviously, I mean, if you hear the piece, it doesn't stay there. There's always an undercurrent of threat um, that I just, I guess, can't escape of, in this case, the threat of, of quiet. The piece sometimes disappears into almost silence or extremely loud hits in, you know, C major, <laughs> but then 
form into diatonic clusters. So there's always a bit of a, a risk in that this, this is never a sort of unquestioned harmony. It's, it's always at, at, at risk and you have to, to work at it. But I think it was really a change for me to, to come to that place. You briefly, um, you briefly mentioned using kind of silence as a, um, a really important part of, you know, and a really interesting landscape to kind of explore. Um, in, in some of the, the reading that we've been doing, we read your, um, your article on the uh, contradictions in contemporary opera, um, specifically regarding the liberation of sound compared to the uh, use of putting forward a narrative. And uh, in that, you mentioned some of the work of Sharino. Um, and just kind of uh, going off of that, we, we performed um, Cordero de Strada um, this past uh, season, and we had just a blast kind of going through and, and living in that world for a little bit. So I was wondering if you had um, any more impressions of, of that kind of, of work. You mean Sherino or? Yes, um, yeah, yeah, yeah. Interesting. I, I mean, I love his music. It's so beautifully composed, beautifully designed sometimes almost, you know. Um, time structures and, and landscapes of, of sound. It was never the biggest influence on my own music, I have to say, because I think what influences us is a, is, is a good question sometimes. And it's often something that well, you have to come to terms with first. So Shirino was never the biggest contradiction I had to work myself through or the, the biggest sort of thorn in, in my aesthetic concepts, you know. Um, I think in that regard, I was much more coined by someone like, Lachmann, um, um, or on the other hand, maybe somebody like, you know, Steve Reich or so, where <laughs> it's, it's so different uh, than my work to, to, to figure out what is that, what I'm interested in here. Um, and, or the recent work of, of Georg Friedrich Haas, you know, which I find fascinating as well in its kind of formal simplicity. So, um, Sharino is, is a fantastic composer. I, I appreciate particularly his opera work, uh, Low and Green. I always want to do this here at Northwestern. Um, and uh, we will at some point. I think he has a, is one of the most interesting contemporary opera composers. Um, but it didn't have so much influence on my own music. And then just kind of more generally, these composers that that are clearly, you know, doing doing good things, but perhaps didn't particularly resonate with you at, at, a, at a given time in your life. What what still can you take from them? What lessons do the do those composers kind of leave you with, even if you're not, you know, taking the stuff directly from them? A lot of craft. I really, I mean, in the, in the old-fashioned sense of instrumental writing in Sherino, it's like endless discovery of string techniques. Uh, how to use multiphonics. I just think of, of Lohan Green, the bassoon <laughs> technique. So stuff like that. Uh, but Sherino also very interesting. I find the time structure, how he uses periodicity and to then disrupt it in a, in a quite controlled way. But we can't got there over this idea of silence, um, which of course is, Sherino is full of beautiful silences. It wasn't an important concept for me in my music silence. And I, I never had this sort of Cajun interest you know um what happens when there's no music it became a focus in my string quartet bagatelle but kind of by coincidence where i after my second opera wanted to write very short bagatelles a bit like the songs maybe <laughs> now with the new opera so clearly confined ideas all based on one object found object from the string quartet literature and i i worked sort of around these objects, faded in and out, and tried to, to put them under the microscope, look at them differently, explore their sonorous qualities and so on. And while I composed this, I developed a drift with all of these towers silence, um, that they all kind of come out of and, and disappear into very quiet bow noise. So a silence that is generated by the instruments disappearing, it sounds to say. And um, so then I got suddenly interested in this concept of silence, of, of where the music disappears. And I think it also had to do with understanding possibilities of outside frame, almost like a threat to the music, where the music is not anymore. That is not just sort of macho, loud, you know, hits where, <laughs> where you disrupt and like, like a quiet threat. And so silence can, that can be it as well. Um, so I think maybe that, that was a, clearly a Sherino influence, but you already have these fantastic silences in, in Schubert, where suddenly the music stops, and, which is a total shock, you know. Um, the question of influence, with the, the piece that's accompanying the percussion counterpart, mm -hmm. 
And I was curious to know what the influence is behind that piece as well as the, the collective three, right? The three counterpart series, um, where you began with those works. I think it was the, it was the attempt to write solo pieces that really deal w with the solo, not just as a fully controlled and overpowered <laughs> medium that is sort of in the service of the composer and then the performer, but something that, that resists. Mm. And we're out of the tension between an object that doesn't fully do what you want to do as a composer, as well as a performer, develops an interesting story. And the first one I wrote was a cello counterpart, which is probably the most brutal in a way where I literally had a thorn in the side of the cello, which is this wedge under the strings that messes with all kinds of intonation. And obviously you can play two strings correctly and so on. So there is something that is, it's a bit like, I always give the example of an actor who has to play with a mask that, you know, mm. and his arms strapped behind the head, uh, his body or something where you, you can't fully articulate yourself. And out of this resistance comes something interesting and new. Um, so that was the idea. It's a little old fashioned dialectics, I guess. And I'm not sure if I would do it this way now, but it's, I had a lot of issues, I guess, <laughs> in the most grad school, you know, and a lot of, I think cello counterpart was one of the most angriest pieces in that regard that I wrote, um, just in sort of dealing with it. Um, and then piano counterpart is doing this already in a slightly quieter way um, where these resonating pitches, the, the silently depressed chord is the counterpart. So a much, mm. much quieter way of resistance or something else happening than what you do with your fingers on the piano. And both of them, by the way, are, are also about discovery, acoustic discovery. So in the cello piece, these fantastic intonation aspects and microtonal things that come out, out of this screwed up uh, strings. And in the piano piece, the beatings that happen um, with some of the silently depressed keys ringing in, in partials that conflict with tempered tuning. That was, so there was a story happening between piano and its preparation that interested me. And then the, to come to the percussion piece, I wanted to write a piece that is not about the things you hit with your mallets, but just as much about the mallets. <laughs> and new music for percussion, and I'm myself guilty of that in Wild Thing, is always like, let's get everything out of the percussion room and you know, I'll do a lot of stuff or than the single triangle. Um, and I wanted something where there is an interesting interaction between the mallet and the surfaces that it hits. And so in this case, a mallet, a bouncing super ball mallet. And interesting, not just in terms of interesting sound, but a temporal uh, dimension. So the bouncing has a rhythm and that you can influence to some degree, but um, so the, the object that is playing has its own time and is a bit of a counterpart to the narrative. The other, other part of the story is the rhythm composed by me. It's actually a quote from Wild Thing. Mm. So these two, the rhythm that I set and the rhythm of the mallets and its object um, create tension. That's kind of the story uh, between uh, of these three pieces. Absolutely, yeah. it's been it's been great, kind of going through your um, your descriptions of them and the scores, and, and and kind of seeing what you were hoping to achieve in, in letting the instrument speak for itself. And um, I'm uh, curious, what do you play it on? What what surfaces do you pick? Um, so I'm planning on doing it on a concert bass drum, two timpani, and then probably great. a floor tom. It's I'm kind of limited in in the instruments that I have at my home, but. Um, Hopefully those those four will will work out and I'll I'll just um, uh, accordingly. I think drums are good because it bounces more. It, yeah, it gives you uh, somebody, a really good Christian Dierstein yeah. played it on gongs and then the reverse chorus because it was just too little springiness, you know. Right. No no interaction. Uh, Absolutely. So, uh, cool. I, I'm um, curious. Uh, yeah, I'm I, I'm really looking forward to, to taking a look at it and I, I definitely appreciate the the writing percussion music for not too many instruments um, because I think there's a lot of really great sounds that you can get just by you know going a little bit farther mm -hmm. with, with one with one area so um, I'm definitely looking forward to, to putting all that great. together. I was worried when I heard it's everything but the kitchen sink that you're playing it on the on coronavirus <laughs> lockdown <laughs> on parts because everything else is out of the studio but okay. <laughs> it would uh, make for an interesting interpretation I think. Yeah. <laughs> <Maybe>. <laughs> We, we um, played a, a set of George Crumb pieces. You brought up George Crumb earlier. We played a, one of his pieces that had an 88 percussion piece set up. Wow, yeah. 
and took it took longer to get everything set up and break it down than it did to rehearse. And I know, I'm guilty of that too. <laughs> <laughs> I actually, I had a question about um, Wild Thing kind of related to that with the, the two percussion parts. And this could just be kind of an aesthetic thing, but you, you break up some of the instruments onto different staves um, themselves instead of giving kind of everything just a different note head or something. And, and mm. sometimes this, uh, we find this in, in some of your other scores, just among a cello part or a piano part where, where you break things up kind of visually to, to separate them. I was wondering what kind of uh, inspired that, that type of, of setting? In Wild Thing, it's, to be honest, it was more, I, I grew up and loved the scores of like the 60s serialist, um, Contacte or um, Circles by Berio. It's probably the percussion piece that has the strongest influence on me. Um, so the idea of organizing your staff as a first step of organizing your setup uh, as a composer, it interested me. Um, I'm not sure if I would do it that extreme today in Wild Thing, but I, I feel it works because it visualizes a setup and how the piece navigates through it. In the pieces for more traditional, staff instruments like uh, cello counterpart or not sure where else in the string uh, Co. I do this to some degree as well it's of course an attempt to treat timbre in a different way than just a supporting coloring layer but timbre the outcome of physical processes on the instruments um, that, that are not just pitch and rhythm um, as, as really its own autonomous layer um, as a way to, to sort of assert its potential for the form, for, for the, the direction of the material. And I think in this regard, I, I see notation as a, as a way to make clear to the performer the weight that certain things have in the, in the score. Mm. Um, I sometimes try to first do it more traditionally, for example, in string playing, soltasto, sol ponticello, and so on. But if you make it its own staff and give it much more weight, it's, it's visually immediately clear this is, this is important. This has structural importance in the piece. So I, I try, in, in some pieces, I think I almost overdid it <laughs> because there is a, you know, that point of too much information. So, but to, it, I think that's an important aspect of composing these days is sort of balance different competing parameters and, and, that way set a stage for the performer to, to know what, what is important. Where, where do I articulate the story of this piece? Mm. Lending a helping hand. Mm -hmm. And the question of intentionality, right? The, compos the composer right. and the performer, the intentionality of sound. Yeah. And in the end, for me as a composer, when I write scores, the notation is all I have. So if I want to break open something, and if it's just a traditional chord progression or in the string quartet, it's yeah, then giving something its own staff, its own layer where it articulates rhythm and time proportions and, and scales, um, it immediately makes clear this, is, this has its own autonomy. And mm. so I, I try to do that. In percussion, it's easier though, because in a way percussion is a less traditional you know, field. So you're, uh, you guys are open to read things differently and even to build your own instruments. Uh, Absolutely, yeah, we, we'll so. do anything weird. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> Just as you mentioned, the cello counterpart is actually on an, a different screen and I actually had the part actually up. I really enjoyed your idea of creating this autonomy between the right and the left hands and how they create narrative. And I thought it was a really interesting idea and I just want to know like, what's your take on creating narrative from something that isn't being directly spoken, like through a voice, something that isn't being directly told? Like, how do you make sound, which is such an abstract, you know, thing? How does that tell the story to you? How does that make a narrative to you? I can only maybe describe my setup, and then where that leads me is sometimes harder to verbalize. The setup here was, on the one hand, melody, literally on the one hand, right. you know, <laughs> going down. Uh, the cello string. Um, so taking this most simple form of narrative in pitch, which is a melody, and, and almost condense it to its most basic form, which is a descending line in this case, or ascending line. And then the other is having a, a structure for the right hand, the bow, to articulate its own time. That's, that's how I started. I put a rhythm that is purposely against the rhythm of the melody, and which is, of course, you know, a little 
tricky for a performer, um, but that's where I felt at some point I also had to reduce and make sure that it really focuses on this very simple counterpoint of these two layers. Uh, but that's how I started. And the, the right hand, I built myself a bit of a system of possibilities for the right hand, which is bow speed, bow pressure. In this piece, also a little bit bow position because it has actually pitch, uh, how do you say, consequences with the, with the mute underneath the pitches speak differently where the, depending on where the bow is positioned. So there's a right arm melody and a left arm melody and they create a counterpoint. And it's a very old fashioned idea of two voices creating something new, you know, where um, tonal harmony or is a result of two voices playing together and creating something third. So that was kind of the idea. And of course, and there are hierarchies, sometimes the left hand is drowned out or if it comes so close to the to the uh, end of the fingerboard, there is no melody left or the bow pressure becomes so strong that it, it breaks any kind of melody. So it's not a happy kind of part all the time, that kind of point, or the, the bow pressure becomes so soft that the pitch doesn't speak. So to, to build something also with some kind of slight aspects of danger in that relationship <laughs> um, interested me as well, yeah. I've read Traces of Meaning more times than I could have talked about. Uh -huh. But this, this relationship, Alex mentioned it earlier, between right, allowing music, music its own autonomy um, to create relationships within itself um, and not having to, to stand in the hierarchy of construction of opera. Mm -hmm. And at, on the other hand, the hierarchy of the construction of opera, right? The, the want to, for, of humans to, to seek narrative. Right. To, to, to whether you give them one or not, to create a narrative within, mm -hmm. within what they hear, within what they see, that, that relationship between sight and sound. It's one that you, you, you consider heavily in your theater works. And I wondered if you could just sort of expound on it a little bit. When I grew up, I, my mother was a theater critic. Uh, so, and she was a single mother. So she often took me to quite progressive plays in the Bond Theater. I had, I had a fantastic public theater. So I grew up with really progressive theater. Um, and at that time, terrible opera in that city, <laughs> which was utterly conservative, basically putting people in costumes, fly in rich you know, voices and put them in costumes and let them sing. So for me, opera was utterly unartistic and theater was progressive. So, and then when I studied in Frankfurt, I, there was a wonderful opera director, um, Sylvain Cambrelin, a famous conductor too who for the first time I experienced wow, this actually is an innovative genre. Now you can actually tell fascinating contemporary stories with it. But nevertheless, I felt I can't really write opera if I don't find an angle where the story is not just somehow supported by the music or simply just illustrated or doubled, but where there's an intrinsic need for music to happen or for story to happen in the music. In my earlier, so I, I felt I, and then I worked three years at the Stuttgart Opera House and I always asked Hans, when are you writing your opera? And I felt, you know, I, I, I can't just see taking some kind of book and putting it to music. So I needed the story of Friend of Medea and the Argonauts to suddenly hit me that what I have been working in music on, this dealing with found objects that are culturally, traditionally, extremely ossified and, um, and have become almost like, hardened um, through society's concept of them, which I then tried to crack open and turn into mm -hmm. sound. Um, Moment Musico is maybe the most extreme version of this where I take a Brahms quotation and a Böhm quotation and slow them down and crack them open until I have a single sound, almost like a catharsic moment where we hear the sound as itself again. So anyway, that was kind of my interest. And then finding a story where this conflict between uh, extremely rationalizing, conceptualizing group of Greeks and then these barbarians, so to say, a woman who stands for almost immediate concept of nature, of, mm. of non-conceptuality, the, the conflict and, and crack each other open. So I needed to find a story like that to find something, music here makes sense because music can be this sound world that leaves narrative behind and literally does it in the stories where, where suddenly we have this moment where we get rid of narrativity for a moment in the music and really hear the sound. So that, I was interested in that. My second opera, Kaspar Hauser, is doing a similar thing where Kaspar Hauser, a foundling 
who had no language and just sort of making weird sounds and, and repeating what he hears from other. So he comes in with expression speech as something extremely non-conceptual, just phonetic, so to say. And then we have this town people who try to culture him, you know, to, to cultivate him or uh, make him civilized and, and put all these structures and concepts on him. I, I simplify extremely here. So to find stories where this conflict between something that is expressive without words and um, but also has a tendency towards expressivity um, is, is really part of the story. In Dark Spring, I'm still not sure. I think maybe I... Maybe I felt more free now that I can, in these songs, don't worry so much about it because it's much more lyrical, you know, it's not as narrative. It's, it's not that the music is Mickey Mousing, describing how people run over the stage or something, you know, or it's really more setting an emotional space in which these people sing. And so maybe that freed me again um, a bit from this demand to write narrative music. Um, mm. Yeah. I, I feel that's sort of where I'm coming from. And that, that let me, I feel that's the power of opera then, to, to give a platform to stories that can't just be told in words or in realistic actions, um, but also go beyond just sound and, and are something more. And when you find that spot, then I think opera is something incredibly fascinating and maybe the most immediate art form um, and can, yeah, can be, quite contemporary art because it, it goes beyond the simple narratives of, of concepts. So. Absolutely. And just to, just to tag on to the end of that there, you know, this, this concept being very clearly uh, prevalent in, in theatrical works or, or works that inherently have a narrative, but how do you kind of apply the same concept to some of your other chamber works that don't necessarily have a written story to tell, but, you know, mm -hmm. still have expression to be given? I, in, in my earlier pieces, I always work with materials that are very strongly content charged um in wild thing it's you know this drum set fill in that comes literally from the uh jimmy hendrix wild thing live performance and the chopin that everybody you know chopin cadence that everybody kind of discovers uh, recognizes as something clearly romantically charged same in, in momo musico in piano counterpart it's all these quotes from piano etudes um in Norma for two pianos. We just released a CD with that. It's, it's gigantic piano of chords. So not just kind of recognizably found objects, but also with a clear message in this. In Neuma, it's this message of, I control the piano and I control the world of sound <laughs> that I want to crack open. So yeah, I, I try to find materials that have a clear semantic content at its core. And that, of course, it's much harder than to crack these open, to not just leave them as, you know, this potpourri of, of, of found objects and, and just dangle them around in a piece. But to find something that opens them up. In, in Noema, it's the, the mutes in the piano that bring out non-tempered pitches. And suddenly the whole etude world of control over 88 keys doesn't work anymore. And um, in cello counterpart, it's, it's also the same, the same rubber wedge, you know. So to find something that then opens up this sound world. And Bagatellen is maybe the last bigger piece where that happens, where these chords, as I already mentioned, they are filtered almost entirely by bow pressure and bow speed in sort of some kind of experience of, of white noise, lautando. Um, so already there, I, I try to reduce the toolbox of <laughs> filters. And in my more recent piece, I think I have less issues now with music that is in a language. Um, so the songs in Dark Spring have things like deceptive cadences, and that has a meaning, that has a narrative. You know, if, if you have a deceptive cadence, suddenly the narrative takes a different unexpected path. Or if a certain pitch space is emptied out, that has a narrative of, of, of emptying out. <laughs> and so I feel I, I have become more relaxed about using speaking in a musical language rather than just quoting it. Um, it's a fine line. Um, sometimes I drift out of that language and sometimes it's not really clear, but that's sort of where I'm at right now, I think. Oh, well, Hans, um, thank you. Yeah. This has been such a privilege. Oh yeah, sure. Yeah, yeah. no, it's fun actually. <laughs> <laughs>
it's it's been a it's been a great pleasure to hear you speak about the music and just recontextualize it for us as listeners and as performers um, to hear it through your hear it through your ears. Absolutely, yeah, we really appreciate it. It's been it's been great to uh, to kind of pick your brain a little bit and uh, hear your perspective. I think it's a great project to have let music new music still happen in in all of this. So I'm I want to be supportive of that. Well, thank you, thank you so much. <laughs> all right, guys, nice to meet you all. Nice to meet you. Thank you. Wonderful to meet you. Thanks so much. Yeah. Bye bye. Thanks so much for tuning into this week's episode of Everything But the Kitchen Sink. We hope you enjoyed it. If you'd like to hear more, you can find all the episodes of our summer series on our YouTube channel and our website, alneaensemble.org. Also, be sure to check out our social media profiles for more information and previews of upcoming episodes. Our handle is alneaensemble. Please feel free to share today's episode with anybody you think might like it, and don't hesitate to reach out if you have any questions or comments. Stay tuned for more episodes of Everything But the Kitchen Sink, released every Friday at 1 p.m. Eastern Time. And as always, we hope you are all safe and well. See you next time. It's one of those things where, you know, you can do it in the practice room 50 times. And, and you know, when you're really on it, you can probably do it again and again. And then you do it in the gig. And it's like, oh, I missed it. You know, I did not. And, and that, you know, that tension is so much a part of, I think, why we well, I mean, it's one of the things that I love about music making. A lot of the stuff I've been working with more recently, particularly these like kinetic instrument things, um, they're really like instruments more than they are material just. So they're, um, and they're like, so they feel like acts of invention a bit. And so once I've invented them, I don't, I'm kind of attached to them or whatever, they're sort of in my repertoire of potential things to use.